Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News on Shri FM 92.7. My name is Beatrice Edu. The news is also live on Kazmi 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. National Commission for Civic Education Research reviews trust in Electoral Commission to conduct a free, fair and transparent election has significantly dropped with just 43 days to the December 7 general election. Also coming up, fears over possible instability heightens after a report shows Islamist militants fighting in Burkina Faso are discreetly using Ghana's north as a logistical and medical rear base to sustain their insurgency. And much later on the program, Matri Workers Association of Ghana serve notice of a nationwide strike in the coming days if the long-standing grievances over poor working conditions are not immediately addressed by the government. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, trust in the Electoral Commission to conduct a free, fair and transparent election has dropped in a latest survey by the National Commission for Civic Education. Ghana is heading to the polls in 43 days in what is seen as a critical election with political fortunes hanging in the balance. The latest survey by the Commission on Civic Education, however, reveals a more than 40% of respondents who have no knowledge about whether or not to trust the Electoral Commission. Uh, let's walk you through uh, the data and trust currently in the Electoral Commission is at 42.1%. Also, 15.3% uh, do not trust the EC and 42.6% do not know whether or not to trust the Electoral Commission. Now, the reason for the low confidence have reservations with EC's leadership handling of elections. Also, those interviewed spoke about the appointment of the leadership of the Electoral Commission, which can affect elections negatively. Electorates have lost trust in the EC in exhibiting transparency in declaration of results. They are easily influenced by one group of people. EC is corrupt. And we do have on the line Make Wusiako. He's convener for Election Watch uh, Ghana. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Bichi. Mm. Does it disturb you that voters' confidence in Ghana's electoral system has declined, as the NCC report indicates, with just less than two months to the polls? A good afternoon to you and to our cherished um, listeners. I think that election words have been very consistent on the conduct of the Electoral Commission when it comes to its transparency, its fairness, and the manner at which we expect it to be very accountable to the good people of Ghana. Unfortunately, it has never happened. And I'm happy that the NCC have conducted a survey which points to the fact that the trust for the Electoral Commission within the populace have um, reduced. And if you look at the things that um, can, can come out with, it's all about decrease of civic engagement, which will definitely affect voter turnout. And it also amplifies social political um, decision making. And it is very difficult that we find ourselves in a common ground. One thing that strikes me most has to do with not just the trust that have reduced in the Electoral Commission, but that of the judiciary um, um, services, which we all see that whatever people complain about, the Electoral Commission is so quick to run to the, the judiciary. And the aftermath of it, or the final result, turns out to be like the, comp the, the judiciary also supports what the Commission is doing. And so definitely it will affect um, 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 the, the trust that people have for the commission. And I think that there, is, that there should be a strategy to employ so that we avert some of these challenges that will come. There should be a strategy to employ, you recommend, but what kind of strategy are you looking forward to? Well, number one has to do with peace campaigns and also to look at promoting nonviolence and peaceful election um, um, programs. 
One other thing too has to do with voter education. Unfortunately, the electoral commission is not engaging in any voter education. You run, you are media general, um, three news for that matter. And it is difficult to hear three news um, talking about election and election related matters, especially in educating the people. NCC is a statutory body required by law to educate the people on their civic rights. Unfortunately, they've been stifled with resources and they are unable to do all these things. So if we are really ready to ensure that we have a very credible election that will be balance free, then we need to look at engaging the citizens on their rights and their responsibilities. Our media engagement should also be targeted looking at promoting accurate reporting and peace messages. You realize that there are some political actors who come on media and say all manner of things and nothing has been done to them. We can also draw back to what happened in 2020, where people were shot dead at the coalition center, where the peace council that is expected to have issued a statement there and then did not do that. We expected that at least the president should have come out to make some statements. He did not do that. And the security agencies that are expected to have come in to ensure that there is law and order, that people who were engaged in that act of killing will be brought to book have also refused to do it. So definitely, you realize that the people themselves feel that um, there is nothing to do until they themselves take up the responsibility upon themselves and react, which will eventually lead to you know, election-related violence. So I hear you give a multifaceted challenge, as it were, and perhaps uh, some of the reasons we are getting the results we are hearing from the NCCE now. Aside from voter education that you just talked about, I immediately, what would you expect to be done? We've had, we, or we have, just less than two months to go into this year's polls. I think, I think we need to do a lot of engagement. Engage, the Peace Council should engage um, the, the, the populace, NCC should be given the needed resources to run various activities that will bring the people together. Um, our chiefs and their people and their reaction when uh, um, candidates visit their, their regions and their communities is, is also a worrying situation. They should also be very mindful not to endorse policy politicians who come to their areas. And that, to me, that, to me, um, is dividing their people. And so they should be very mindful about that. If you ask me, I think that we need to do more in engaging the populace, talking to them more about the need to ensure that they go in there to cast their votes as their civic rights demand. Well ended here. Thank you very much, Marco Siako. He's convener for Election Watch uh, Ghana, sharing his views on that latest report by the NCCE that people do not trust the Electoral Commission going into this year's general election. Uh, let's bring in some more. The Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research has commenced exploratory research into a newly identified species of malaria vector in Ghana called Anopheles tevensai, uh, speaking at an inaugural lecture as part of the Institute's 45th anniversary celebrations, a former director of epidemiology, Professor Kojan Sakuram, emphasized the need for a collective effort to combat the devastating impact of malaria in the country. Anopheles, the malaria transmission vectors, probably have about 30 or 40 different species across the world and things. Stevens Eye is found mostly in the Asian countries. We have Anopheles gambi, which is a very efficient vector. The difference is that gambi, as was mentioned, lives mostly in the rural areas with uh, clean the breeding spaces and things, with sunlit areas. Stevens Eye is adapted to urban areas and may be able to breed in places where we think it's too dirty for Anopheles to breed, for example. So in our urban areas where we haven't cleaned properly and things, if we are not careful, it will colonize those places and will give us different problems. We know Stimizai breeds in urban areas from the work done in Asian countries and things. Is our urban space the same as the urban space in Thailand or something? We don't know. So that is why we don't even want it to get here before we start looking at all these things. So we can't go ahead of ourselves and say, do this or don't do this to me. Basically, what we need to do is 
keep your surroundings clean because when you do that you will get rid of mosquitoes you get rid of this you get rid of this as i said cleanliness is next to godliness and you heard the uh, former director of epidemiology at uh, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, Professor Kojan Koram, some 10 minutes past the hour of 12. When we come back, we'll tell you more about uh, the Islamic militant fighting in Burkina Faso and the rippling effects on Ghana. Don't go away. Big money, money, money. Want more money? More moolah? More kudi? More sika? Or more lajan? Yes! Then win more moolah with 30 Ghana cities free credits when you play Game Parks Pick 1 and Pick 4 games for the first time. How? Just dial star 946 hash or visit the nearest Game Park agent to play, get your first bet and win on us with a 30 Ghana city welcome bonus. Oh yes, it's all about the moolah. Win more moolah with Game Game Park today. Go to GameParkGames.com for more information. Game Park is licensed by the NLA. Play responsibly. Not suitable persons under 18 years. And you're so here on the Midday News on Shri FM 92.7. Thank you for staying. Now, Islamist militants fighting in Burkina Faso are discreetly using Ghana's north as a logistical and medical rare base to sustain their insurgency. Seven sources told Reuters a move that could help them expand their footprint in West Africa. The sources, which includes Ghanaian security officials and regional diplomats, said that Ghanaian authorities appeared to be mostly turning a blind eye to the insurgents crossing over from neighboring Burkina Faso to stock up on food, fuel and even explosives as well as getting injured fighting, uh, fighters treated in hospitals. Ghana shares a 600 kilometer, that's 372 mile border with Burkina Faso. The country at the heart of an insurgency that has killed thousands, displaced millions and, according to some experts, turned the Sahel region into the epicenter of global terrorism as factions loyal to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State group expand their presence. Arms experts have, in the recent years, traced explosive charges and detonator court used in bombs targeting UN and government troops in Mali back to mining operations in Ghana. Ghana. And that's according to a UN report. So what's the effect of all these activities on Ghana's territorial integrity and peace? Albert Yel Young is National Network Coordinator of the Ghana Office West African Network for Peace Building. He joins us live on the phone. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to your listeners. That, does this report come to you as a surprise? Uh, not at all, um, because um, this information has been there for quite some time now and also if you monitor the dynamics um, through um, several mechanisms um, as you would know one has an early warning mechanism uh, this information uh, is, is, is has been captured you know if you look at you read several researches uh, by other institutions uh, that have been involved in picking data as far as the dynamics in Burkina Faso or the Sahel is concerned. You know, these are things that definitely uh, are things that are not new to us, um, those of us who are on the ground. If you check, for instance, um, we have several harbors uh, that are transporting goods um, to the Sahel. You know, we have vehicles, you know, um, that are transported uh, through the ports of Ghana into the Sahel. We have fuel that we are supplying the Sahelian countries. And, of course, um, if the extremists will commute or move to locations to attack, they will definitely uh, need fuel to be able to power their vehicles to move. You know, we are having several goods, um, uh, consumables, that are passing through the ports of Ghana into uh, these Sahelian uh, areas. Even uh, common food stuff produced by our own uh, communities are transported into uh, these areas. Now, we also have mining operations that we have several people who are from these Sahelian countries, West African countries, involved in Galamse and small-scale mining. Um, and you will not know what exactly, in terms of the proceeds, are uh, used for over there in, uh, in the Sahelian or Burkina Faso. You know, so Ghana serves as you know, a logistics center. We have even the movement of arms, small arms and light weapons and ammunitions, you know, 
it is understood from certain data that they are passed through Ghana and even some are locally uh, produced. You know, and indeed, some of the uh, extremists uh, have been observed to have recuperation in Ghana when the heat is, is, is really hot, you know, in, in, in Burkina Faso. They come back into Ghana, uh, come into Ghana to recuperate and then return, you know. And so there, it's not the first time also that we have had a concern um, from us saying that the um, Sahelian countries of Burkina Faso uh, has raised that, you know, uh, the state of Ghana might not be paying attention to information intelligence uh, that is shared with them. Um, I mean, within certain quarters, this information has come up. You know, but we also know that the Ghana government has deployed several security agencies. There is uh, intelligence, you know, mechanisms that have been deployed, you know, and uh, they, are, they are on the ground. Mm. You know, so what we need to know is what are the gaps that may, you know, be existing as far as intelligence gathering is concerned. What gaps you know, do you are we know? adopting a whole of uh, a stakeholder approach to gather information? What gaps yes, do you please. know as we speak? Say again. What gaps do you know? Because that's the question you pose, that what is left is to find out I what mean, gaps that are available. And I'm asking what you know. That it would appear that there is not much collaboration between the security agencies and the communities. Um, the posturing of some of the agencies is such that the community members are not comfortable sharing information with them. You know, So it would be encouraging for the deployment to adopt an approach, you know, a, a certain posturing that will enable the communities to uh, relate with them and share information. So building civilian security relations, especially mm -hmm. along the border posts and at risk communities, you know, is very important. That Do can then enhance information gathering. That uh, And this should be done across, not just for Ghana, but how do we share information across the borders? So, Mr. Yoyan, do I hear you? Mm, do I hear you say that perhaps the see something say something may not be working as effectively as expected? It has gradually gathered, you know, momentum um, across some of the. But the issue is that what really do we encourage or do we want them to see and to say? You know, so there is much more awareness we need to do. Let the communities or populations know that this is what we expect you to see. And should you see that we expect you to share with A, B, C, D, you know, the uh, numbers that have been given, you know, I mean, publicly, it's not everyone that is very familiar with these numbers. Is it possible for us to have some post of the numbers at some vantage points that when community members, for instance, pick up information, they can call those lines directly without having to go through a certain structure? that will enable them to then report this information. There's also... As so, I indicated. Mm, there, there's as a, I indicated, yes. Uh, there's also there's also this suggestion that uh, Ghana has a non-aggression pact with the jihadist reason uh, the country ha has a escaped attacks. Uh, is that some the information you have as well? Um, I would not say exactly so, because um, you will not be having a kind of an agreement with a group that you know, everyone seems not to be uh, comfortable with, you know. So it might just be that Ghana is doing its work based on its capacity and what it knows, and based on its, its interest to protect the territorial integrity of the populations and to make sure that everyone goes about his or her business without fear or, you know, any intimidation by any uh, extremist uh, agent, you know. So I would not say that Ghana is having any pact, you know, with any group and of course it is not anything that any any state would like to have We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, Albert Yeo Young. He's National Network Coordinator of the Ghana Office West Africa Network for Peace Building One Up. Now, the Mortuary Workers Association of Ghana has warned the government threatening to embark on a nationwide strike in November if the long-standing grievances of its members are not addressed. The association, which represents the interest of mortuary workers across the country, is calling for urgent improvement in their working conditions, including better wages, a safer working environment, and the provision of essential personal protective equipment, PPEs. The association says these issues have persisted since 2019 with little to no action from authorities to resolve the problem. And General Secretary at the Mortuary Workers Association of Ghana, Richard Kofi Jordan, joins us live on the line now. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us.
Good afternoon to you, and let me also greet all our members across the country. Mm. Last month, you called off your intended strike after talks with the government or with government officials. What changed for you? The the, the reason you're issuing another threat? I think the, we, we didn't call off because we had a meeting with government. We kept the strike on hold because of the public outcry. So it is not necessarily uh, government that actually asked us to call off. We decided that the fact that the public at that time needed our help and we leaders across the country, the imams, the chiefs and others are calling, let's also extend our strike to let, let's let's keep let's keep it on hold and allow two weeks for government to resolve the matters before them. And it wasn't resolved. Mm. Exactly so. Unfortunately, you know, we, we gave government two weeks which ended in on the ninth of October. Uh, the idea is that within this period we'll be able to resolve them. Uh, if if they were not able to resolve, we would have started our strike on the 10th of October. Unfortunately, it coincided with the organized with Bad Galam staff, where Mochi Workers are also a member. So it actually distorted our timetable. Currently, as I speak, we have not seen any practical solution being offered. Even though I have cited letters, some letters, and we've been giving some letters, uh, we think that these things, we've, we've seen them over time. For the past four years, we've seen similar letters with no effect. And therefore, we are one government. And for that matter, all those who have been charged with responsibility of governing, that come November, we are not going to leave any stone on 10 yep. until total solution is provided. So that means that in November, if you don't hear from the government, you will not even listen to the plea of the public you listened to uh, when you threatened earlier. It's not about hearing from government. As for government, we'll be hearing from government. No, I'm talking we'll about the public. Provide. You said that the first one, you you listened to the pleas of uh, Ghanaians yes, yes. who needed, and I'm saying that this time around, are you saying that if the government doesn't come in, you will not listen to those pleas any longer? Exactly. So it is a public. It is the interest of the public for the sake of the public. That is why we kept those strike, that strike on hold. This time around, we are not going to listen from to anybody. But we are giving enough time for solution to be provided. So we, we are waiting. In fact, as I speak to you, I've cited a letter from Minister of Finance directing controller to do some payment to our workers. We are waiting. Salaries are not yet in. And we think by close of the month, we should see. Uh, we've seen some letter asking us to provide some data in terms of coronavirus, uh, bonus, and all that. But we are saying that that is not enough for us to say that we will not embark on that strike. Wind it here. Thank you very much. General Secretary, Matri Workers Association of Ghana, uh, Richard Kofi Jordan, uh, speaking to us about the group's intent or impending strike. Now, wife of Alan Kweji, Chairman Ting, and supporters of Movement for Change have stormed the Adar Junction market, promising them a better Ghana. Alan's wife assured the market women of a massive transformation if they vote for Movement for Change, led by her husband. Joseph Armstrong is on that tour with the team. He joins us live on the line. Uh, Joseph, what more can you tell us beyond what I just said? And we'll connect to Joseph Armstrong very shortly. But ahead of that, the newly appointed Commissioner of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Brigadier General uh, Bawa Ayeroga, has warned that some staff of the organization who engage in corrupt deals will be severely punished. Listen to what he said. It's not an easy tax, an easy uh, issue to to ask people to pay taxes. But without taxes, we cannot devolve our country. So basically, I am in this collection using your platform to appeal to various stakeholders to urge and encourage uh, our traders our business communities uh, to, to fulfill their promise by paying taxes. A lot of companies are indebted. So we go to encourage them to make good their promises in terms of taxes. Yeah, sometimes we do not want to close down the companies. Sometimes a company can, a company, I don't want to mention names, have employees, our 800 uh, employees. Imagine closing down the company. It's a fact. 
and he had the newly appointed Commissioner of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Brigadier General Bawa Aya Ruga. And let's return to that story about Alan Tremonting and the team of Movement for Change at the Adar Junction Market. Talking to the market women, Joseph Armstrong is with them. He joins us live. Hopefully he can hear us. Joseph, what more can you tell us? Yeah, baby. So currently we've moved from the Adan Janshin Market to the Adan Lewis the, uh, River Bank, where uh, we also have another market here. And uh, wives of, uh, wife of uh, Mr. Alan Tremantin, that is Patricia Tremantin, is the one leading the uh, tour this time around, where she's promising the market to men, a modern market, a market where you will not see that, a market that has a school, a market that has a clinic, a market that has a standard lorry station, where uh, everything will be in order. So the people, as in the traders here, should consider her husband, uh, Mr. Lantemati, and vote massively for him to bring the change that we've all been getting for. And she also promised the people of Adam that there are roads that are in a terrible state when Lantemati comes. He's going to fix the roads and ensure that Adam will be a tourist destination after this. Thank you very much, Joseph Armstrong, following Alan Tremanting and the Movement for Change team uh, to the NDC and the party's uh, vice presidential candidate, Professor Nana Jinopokwajiman, is on a campaign tour of the Upper East region. This is coming just days ahead of the December 7 general election. In, a December, uh, in the December 2020 election, NDC's John Mahama secured uh, 300 and... Uh, 22,317 valid votes representing 63%, whilst the MPP had 34.4% of valid vote cast. Professor Nana Jenopokwajiman's presence in the region highlights the NDC's focus on sub mobilizing support to maximize voter turnout. And we'll bring you more later. And that's it for the news here on Shri FM 92.7. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to shrinews.com for more news. Have a good afternoon. The most comprehensive election coverage. Top-notch presenters and well-versed analysts. Dedicated reporters and correspondents in every nook and cranny across the country. All the action, every incident reported. All the big stories covered. All facts questioned. Every figure verified. Monitored and accounted for. The numbers tallied, analyzed, and interpreted. We have invested time and energy in order to bring you a comprehensive elections coverage. The whole world will be watching us on TV, online, and radio. Election Command Center. Facts, analysis, results. Biggest food, drink, and music festival is returning this October. The Eat, Drink, Music Festival is back. Let's go! For two unforgettable days filled with the best food and drink vendors, top DJs, and amazing musicians. Join us for an experience like no other, featuring world class performances, a variety of local and continental foods, drinks, and fun activities. Oh, yeah. Location Good Park, Accra Mall. Dates 26th and 27th October 2024. Time 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Get your tickets now on all networks by dialing star 714 star 500 hush. For more information, visit www.eatdrinkmusicfestival.com. Eat Drink Music Festival, the ultimate festival experience. Imagine a place where voices matter, where every corner, every street, every community is a platform. A big bus moving through Accra, carrying conversations, questions, and the pulse of the nation. This is not just another show, it's your voice on the move. 
Join us as 3FM Sunrise hits the road, turning ordinary streets into platforms for extraordinary dialogue. Speak freely, listen deeply, and help shape the conversation that drives Ghana forward. Look out for the bus and tune in exclusively on 3FM 92.7, your urban lifestyle radio. Accra gets busy on this frequency. 92.7, 3FM. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. Coming up, government reiterates, reiterates commitment to fiscal discipline with debt limits and independent oversight council post-debt restructuring exercise. We'll hear from Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam. We are seeking amendments to the existing fiscal responsibility legislation to impose debt limits on ourselves. And the International Monetary Fund IMF projects Ghana's debt-to-GDP ratio to reach 83% by end of 2024 and expected to decline to 69.7% by 2029. We'll bring you details of that and more. My name is Menu Afo. Please stay tuned. And now on to the details. Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam has reassured that government will maintain strict fiscal discipline to avoid a return to unsustainable debt levels. Speaking at the IMF World Bank annual meetings, he described Ghana's recent domestic debt exchange as a painful exercise and outlined plans for fiscal reforms, including amendments to fiscal responsibility laws and the establishment of an independent fiscal council. This new council so he said, will monitor government's debt management to ensure compliance with debt limits and support the nation's financial stability. We have to state that, first of all, because the domestic debt we did was a very painful exercise. Very painful exercise uh, because uh, people did not expect that. Mm. And so to have taken the people of Ghana through this painful exercise has meant that they had to sacrifice beyond what many people could do. And because of that, they are demanding fiscal discipline. They are demanding fiscal stability. And, and that is why it will be very difficult to go back to the era of unsustainable debt. The implementation of far-reaching uh, structural reforms, you know, to build our resilience and one of the structural reforms uh, relate to the fiscal responsibility legislation. We are seeking amendments to the existing fiscal uh, responsibility legislation to impose debt limits on ourselves and we are also putting in place a fiscal uh, council that will ensure compliance with the fiscal rules. The fiscal council is supposed to be an independent council which will outside the government monitor our progress in terms of uh, uh, debt management, in terms of how much we borrow, how we repay, mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that we do not go beyond the limit that we are imposing. Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam reiterating government's commitment to fiscal discipline with debt limits and independent oversight council post-debt restructuring exercise. Now, the IMF has projected Ghana's debt-to-GDP ratio will rise to 83% by the end of 2024, according to its October Fiscal Monitor report. Released at the fund's annual meetings in Washington, D.C., this outlook highlights Ghana's ongoing fiscal struggles fueled by a high debt burden and currency depreciation. However, the IMF expects a gradual improvement in Ghana's debt levels, anticipating a decline to 69.7% by 2029, provided the sustained fiscal discipline and structural reform. My colleague Bismarck Ausa has the details in the following news desk report. This initiative is a collaborative effort between the Ghana Health Service and the Ghana Education Service to promote the health and immunity of school aged children. The World Health Organization estimates that nearly one in four of the world population, or over 1.5 billion people globally, are infested with the intestinal worms, with more than 880 million school aged children requiring attention. In Ghana, Sister Somiasis has an estimated countrywide prevalence of 23.3%. 
with localized prevalence that will exceed 50 percent. This is serious, and I think it's something we need to work on, to work on it. These infestations are typically transmitted by contact with contaminated soil or water and tend to affect the school inventory more severely due to their underdeveloped immune systems. Additionally, children in schools and playgrounds are often in close contact, increasing the likelihood of transmission of intestinal worms. School-based worming is the most cost-effective approach that leverages existing school structures with teachers trained to administer hermetic medicines to eligible children and also provide education. The exercise is expected to reach thousands of children between the ages of 5 and 14 and provide them with a treatment to ameliorate the effects of plastic worm infestation. That was a three business news report on IMF October fiscal monetary report projecting Ghana's debt to GDP ratio will rise to 83% by the end of 2024 and decline to 69.7% by 2029. Away from that, Ghanaian organizations are being urged to adopt agile methodologies to enhance operational efficiencies and improve customer offerings. These principles focus on fle flexibility, collaboration, and a strong customer orientation, enabling rapid decision-making and swift responses to market changes. At the Agile to Africa conference held at the University of Ghana in Accra, consultant Kwesi Amponsa emphasized the importance of agility across all sectors for organizations aiming to fully embrace digital transformation. We are not thinking as digital businesses and therefore we are not behaving as digital businesses. And that in itself presents a core problem to enabling agile practices and agility within our organized nations. The first step is that we must recognize that we are a digital organization. And once we recognize that we are a digital organization, Accra gets busy on this frequency, 92.7, 3FM. We are a digital organization. And once we recognize that we are a digital organization, our strategic planning, our strategic objectives all become aligned towards digital initiatives. And by aligning to digital initiatives, it allows us to think about the processes that we need to put in place, the tooling that we need to put in place, the people we need to put in place, how we organize as an organization or as a business. And then it allows us to really think critically critically about how we engage our customers and in so doing be become more responsive to our customers whilst at the same time being proactive to our customers needs you heard agile consultant Chrissy Amponsa there in more stories business consultant Grace Johnson has emphasized the importance of training employees in the use of artificial intelligence tools to prevent the dissemination of inaccurate information that could impact decision making in an interview with three business she highlighted the necessity of verifying and customizing AI generated data which is only achievable through proper training so for anybody that gets to use AI you understand that there you have to be first of all an expert because if the AI turns out uh, uh, information or knowledge that you're now where you might just end up putting it into company processes and all of that I might you know be of great damage so it's important to really feed them in with the knowledge train them right to understand their context understand uh the fact that you have to be even if you're using llms or any kind of model that is tailor-made tailor fits for a particular organization that's when we talk of proprietary tools uh, you have to understand the importance of the human in the loop the supervisory approach whatever it turns out you have to go through it and still adapt it customize it adapt it and tailor fit to what the organization is, is really asking for it uses predictive analysis to bring, bring out output so sometimes you may hallucinate it gives you wrong information it can even go as much as giving you wrong references so you have to be knowledgeable know what is true still go back to google and search and see if this information is verifiable before you turn it out so it's really important to have people trained so that they are the human in the loop Additionally, Johnson warned organizations against using open source AI tools, citing the risk of exposing trade secrets to competitors. For organizations, it's more important to understand the difference between open source tools and proprietary tools and go for proprietary. Because the moment you don't embrace this age of AI and create the platform where the skills, your, your human resource, right, 
are upskilled and reskilled for this age of AI to adapt. They begin to explore tools that may become harmful to your organization. They begin to, you know, ex they may they may begin to expose your organization to, you know, organizational data to open source tools, and that becomes beneficial for the tool, like Chat GPT, the LLM, Claude, Gemini, and all of those. And if if your your your, your human resource doesn't understand the importance of masking data and not exposing your organization, you know, to these tools, uh, you risk exposing organizational secrets, organizational competitive advantage to your competitor. Because I could go on any of the chatbots and ask the chatbot what the other organization is doing. And because he has a massive data set, he might just tell me what you're doing. Business consultant Grace John Singh there, ending business daily here on 3FM 92.7. For more business stories, please check out our website. It's www.3news.com. My name is Minwa Fo. Please stay tuned and enjoy the rest of our programs.